Hey everyone, it's me, John Lorden. Happy Friday. Welcome to another episode of Brain Scratch for today, October, Friday the 13th, 2017. And for today's episode, I went back to the list, looked through your suggestions, and I noticed one that has come up pretty consistently since almost the beginning of the Brain Scratch show. And every every now and then I just get a regular ping about this case. So I wanted to dive into today's case, the case of Ricky McCormick. Now we have had one case featured on the channel before about letters being written in code. Of course, I'm talking about the Zodiac Killer. Um, this is a bit in the same vein, but quite a bit different because uh, Ricky McCormick seems to be the victim in this case. And we think that he's the one that wrote this encoded letter that he left behind. So uh, with all that being said, let's jump into the details on this case. Starting with uh, STL Today, this is uh, in St. Louis, Missouri. Uh, this is a, a local paper. And this is an article actually from July 6th of 1999. We're reaching back just a little bit, but you'll see there's an important development that happens uh, a little bit after this. Major case squad investigators say they can find no evidence of a crime in the death of Ricky McCormick, 41, whose body was found near a cornfield near West Alton last week. Medical examiners had not been able to determine a cause of death. A woman found McCormick's body early Wednesday near Highway 367 west of West Alton. Authorities have said McCormick suffered from chronic heart and lung illnesses, which could have contributed to his death. Regular brain scratchers out there know I like to find articles that start around the same time as whatever I'm investigating, just because I like to understand what the press was focusing on at that time. So here we have a pretty Interesting case, uh, mainly in that they can't identify uh, how he died. Now, according to other information I re I've reviewed, um, he was in this cornfield for approximately three days. It was very warm uh, this time of year and in that area, and it was humid, and apparently his body had decomposed fairly dramatically. So that seems to be the reason why they haven't been able to determine a cause of death. Personally, I'm a little surprised at that. I, I don't think I've bumped into another case where they found a body only three days later and they couldn't determine the, the cause of death. Um, I think that's kind of rare uh, in itself, but at least for the cases I've covered here on the channel. Uh, let's learn a little bit more about Ricky by jumping over to Wikipedia just to get a little bit about his background. McCormick was a high school dropout who had held multiple addresses in the Missouri, Illinois regions of St. Louis, Belleville, and Fairview Heights, sometimes living off and on with his elderly mother. McCormick suffered from chronic heart and lung problems. He was not married, but had fathered at least four children. At the time of his death, he was 41 years old, unemployed, and on disability. Now, you're going to find as we go through this case, there's a lot of places where there seems to be conflicting stories. Um, here, they're saying that he's unemployed. We're going to find out later. It seems like he was working at a local gas station. Uh, it could be that that was in an unofficial capacity. Once you kind of understand what was going on around that gas station, you'll probably get a better sense of that. But um, let's continue. So the main development that happened in this case came about 12 years later when the FBI basically posted um, this story on their website. And they are looking for cryptanalysts, people that are into uh, cryptography and trying to decode cryptography. And they presented letters. Now, um, they didn't mention this back at the time, of course, in the article that we read, but there was a few things found in his pockets. One of them was a receipt for an emergency room visit, which he had recently been to, and two pieces of paper. Um, this is a picture of one of the pieces of paper right here. And you can see it's written in what looks like English, uh, as opposed to, you know, when you look at the Zodiac killer letters, you see some strange symbols being used in there. This looks pretty much like, uh, you know, English alphabet being used, but you can see that it's not being used in a, in a way that you can understand the words that are happening here. Some interesting things happening, particularly, <laughs> particularly with parentheses. Uh, you can see they're used several times in the message. I don't know if they are grouping part of the message. Um, I don't know if possibly, I don't think he's using them as spaces, but there's, there's a lot of them happening in the message here. 
Um, and that's just one of the many odd things that people have noted in this. But uh, despite extensive work by our cryptanalysts, uh, cryptanalysis, sorry, and Racketeering Records Unit, CCRU, as well as help from the American Cryptogram Association, the meanings of those two coded notes remain a mystery to this day, and Ricky McCormick's murderer has yet to face justice. Now, this is an interesting aspect to this case that I don't really see addressed on, you know, many different places that I've, I've read up on this case. How did we go from, we don't know his cause of death, potentially could have been a natural death considering, uh, you know, he had pre-existing conditions. On top of that, according to some reports, when he went to his hospital visit, he was a heavy smoker. He drank a ton of coffee. I don't think either of those go well with a heart condition. Um, but for some reason, by the time the FBI releases this, admittedly 12 years later, and I'm sure they have information the public doesn't, there's still no explanation about how this went from potentially a natural death, he's found in the middle of a field, to um, this is a murder. I mean, they're, they're calling it out right here. They're looking specifically for his murderer. I just, I don't know why. I don't know how that conclusion was made. I don't know if they did further uh, autopsies on him and were able to find something. Um, nothing that I can find has been released publicly about why that has changed. Um, they then talk about breaking any code involves four basic steps, determining the language used, determining the system used, reconstructing the key, and reconstructing the plain text. And I've heard one of the experts talk about this case. He says they cannot get it past step two. Basically, they're not sure what type of system was used for how these words were mixed up, but they do seem fairly confident that the language that, that's being used in it is indeed English. To move the case forward, examiners need another sample of McCormick's coded system or a similar one that might offer context to the mystery notes or allow valuable comparisons to be made. Or, short of new evidence, maybe someone with a fresh set of eyes might come up with a brilliant new idea. And that's the main reasoning why the FBI posted this publicly. Um, I don't know why, but on this website, they only have one of the pages. But if you go to the Wikipedia article, of course, the links are down below, uh, you'll see they have both pages posted there, page one and page two. And once again, just the things that keep grabbing me about this in terms of grouping, not only do we have the parentheses going on, but he's literally blocking whole sections of text here and circling around them. Um, this leads some people to believe that this could be some type of to-do list that meant something to him, maybe uh, some things that he was supposed to do. Potentially, could this be drug related? Could these be you know, could this be delivery information, what he's supposed to drop off, what he's supposed to pick up, where he's supposed to take it. There's a bit more than just a, um, a scratch in my brain that might support that information, but we'll get that as we roll forward here in the story. Uh, I want to give a very big shout out to riverfronttimes.com. They did a whole piece on this. It was written by Christopher Trito, hope I'm saying that right, um, June 14th of 2012. It is a very long piece. Of course, we're not going to go through quite all of it, but I did pull some salient facts out of it that I want to share with you guys. If you only read one article, I know I say this in every episode, um, outside of watching this episode, this is the article. It goes really in depth into some aspects that um, I'm not going to necessarily go to in depth here, but a lot of facts that are um, laid in here. So first of all, when he was found, um, filthy Lee blue jeans and a stained white t-shirt is all that he wore. It mentions he was also uh, five feet and six inches tall. Found in a cornfield in rural St. Charles County, uh, 20 miles from where he worked and lived in downtown St. Louis. I've seen other people say about 15 miles, but somewhere from 15 to 20 miles away from where he usually should have been is where he was found in this cornfield. Um, 
this article does mention that this cornfield got to be known as a bit of a criminal dumping ground. It seemed like several other bodies popped up, uh, one before he showed up there and then two after he showed up there. Um, so there could be something of a, of a criminal element that's using this area specifically for dumping bodies. St. Charles County Medical Examiner's Office ultimately ruled McCormick's cause of death undetermined, yet police suspected foul play. Once again, we're just getting another, um, another point here in terms of we don't know what killed this guy. If it was something obvious like a bullet wound, that probably would have marked his skeleton at some point. They probably would have been able to detect that. Uh, knife wounds quite frequently can chip away at parts of bone. They're usually able to detect that. Uh, if he was choked, uh, I know <laughs> someone sent me a little uh, email about my um, video on Kanika that I just released. I said thyroid bone. It's actually hyoid bone. Thank you for the correction on that. Uh, if someone is strangled, typically the hyoid bone is broken, and that's a very clear indicator when they're conducting autopsies. Nothing like that is noted in this case. So um, very interesting. We don't know how this guy really died. Homicide detectives searched the 41-year-old victim's pockets for clues and interviewed his relatives, girlfriend, and others who knew him. Soon, leads began to run dry. 12 years passed, and then everything changed. In March of 2011, FBI officials made a rare and remarkable revelation. Two pages of handwritten encrypted notes found stuffed in a pocket of McCormick's jeans. Uh, another thing that I don't really see addressed um, in analysis around this case is any type of handwriting comparison to known writing examples from him so that we could at least verify that he's the person that actually wrote those notes. One of the theories that's kicking around this is if he was involved in some type of illegal activity, perhaps he was just a courier for this message. So this message could have been written by someone else. He might not even know what it is. He's supposed to take it to somebody and they're able to take that message and understand what it means. Um, but I have seen no analysis about Ricky, particularly handwriting samples from him being compared to these letters and verifying that he did indeed write them. Despite that, from what I'm seeing from the FBI analyst that's working on it, he seems fairly convinced that this is Ricky. Ricky did indeed write these letters. It turns out McCormick's riddle, allegedly written by a man who could hardly write his own name, has stumped the world's foremost code breakers. This is another thing you're going to see if you look into this case. Some people say that he was practically illiterate. Other, others say, no, he was, he was literate. He almost got through the school system. He wound up dropping out uh, in high school, but he was perfectly capable of reading and writing. Um, so quite honestly, I don't, I don't know which side is more accurate there. His family has some comments we're going to get to later that might give us a little bit of better insight into uh, how smart or not so smart he may have been. Some have suggested the notes are meaningless, the random scribblings of a man who by all accounts was functionally illiterate and demonstrated a low IQ. The FBI examines hundreds of suspected codes each year. After weeding those out that are nonsense from the codes the Bureau categorizes as solvable, only about 1% go unbroken. And I think that's a really big reason why uh, FBI is asking for help in this. I think it's also a big reason why this case became so famous once they did so, uh, particularly on the internet and for internet sleuths to look into. Um, when you consider that only 1% go unbroken, that is, that's a pretty high success rate they have for cracking these things. But for some reason, these letters elude them. Respondents um, to the FBI's webpage have suggested that the encrypted notes could mask information and everything from vehicle identification numbers, gambling books, and drug dealing transactions to addresses and directions, mental health episodes, or medications. Um, that's another theory that I saw kicked around on this. Uh, someone on Reddit actually posted a pretty lengthy analysis about potentially he was using this coded writing to track his mental health, to track episodes that he was having, to track medication he was taking, to track uh, when he was supposed to take that type of medication. From what I saw from that person's analysis, it wasn't a, a really solid match in my eyes, but they did make some of the letters kind of tie together with some phrasing. That was interesting. It was at least something that I think uh, should be considered 
If he was embarrassed about his mental health for some reason, maybe he would write things like that and keep them encoded. Um, I don't know, just just another consideration in this very hard to crack case. Ricky McCormick always stood out as different from his peers. His mother, Frankie Sparks, describes him as, quote, retarded. And I know that's not the PC term to use. This is a direct quote from his mother. His cousin, Charles McCormick, suspects Ricky might have suffered from schizophrenia or bipolar disorder. Uh, quote, Ricky went to see a psychiatrist and he said Ricky had a brick wall in his mind, remembers Gloria McCormick, an aunt better known as Cookie, in whom Ricky often confided. He said Ricky refused to break that wall. He didn't like the life of living poor and had an active imagination. Uh, as a boy, he spent so much time at recess standing off by himself that his mother would receive calls from school administrators asking if anything was wrong. He could hardly read or write when he dropped out of St. Louis, former Martin Luther King High School on North Kings Highway. And once again, I just want to point out that is very different information from other um, sources that you're going to read on this. But this article is stating it fairly straightforward and clear. I have to say of all the articles I've read, uh, I trust this article the most because I can tell there was some investigative re reporting that went on here. The person actually spoke to people directly. He's not quoting other sources. This isn't secondhand or thirdhand information. Um, so I tend to believe his analysis. Plus, we have his quotes from the family. I mean, Ricky's mother's description of him, that, that can't be easy for a mother to say about their son. Uh, we have other family members thinking that he's dealing with something very severe. And then, of course, that comment about him standing off at recess all on his own. Um, it almost makes me wonder if one possible thing that happened here is that he went for a walk and just wound up out there and then had some type of medical event or emergency. Um, I don't know. He uh, worked occasional odd jobs, a floor mopper, a dishwasher, a busboy, service station attendant, and he also collected disability checks due to his chronic heart problems, apparently that he had suffered uh, for most of his life. Uh, in November of 1992, St. Louis police arrested the 34-year-old McCormick for having fathered two children with a girl younger than 14 years old. While awaiting trial on the first degree sexual abuse charge, McCormick's public defender noted she had reasonable cause to believe McCormick was suffering from some mental disease or defect. They deemed him fine to stand trial. He wound up pleading guilty. And then according to this article, he spent 13 months behind bars. Other ones said it was 11 months, but basically he did about a year on that and then was released about a year early on a conditional uh, release. Now, this is where we get into some interesting information, and this article dives into this a lot more than I want to for the scope of this episode, but um, there were there was a family, basically two brothers, that ran a local gas station uh, called Amoco uh, that was south of downtown St. Louis, and Ricky worked there. Now, I don't know if he worked there in an official capacity, like, you know, we heard in his job descriptions before that one of the jobs he had was um, a service station attendant. I don't know if this is that gas station, uh, but it does seem that he probably worked there also in an unofficial capacity. Um, there seemed to be some crime that was happening with these two brothers that owned this gas station. Now, one of these brothers in particular, his name is uh, Baha, he was known as Bob uh, Hamdala, seemed to be a bit of a bad dude. And if you go ahead and take the time to read this full article, you're gonna get a couple of examples. This guy's kind of violent, um, but he doesn't always seem to get away with it in an interesting uh, thing that I noticed while reading through this. But uh, just keep him in mind as we roll forward on the information here. About two weeks before his death, Ricky McCormick purchased a one-way bus ticket to Orlando. It would turn out to be the last of at least two brief trips to Florida he made that year. Phone records show he or his girlfriend, Sandra Jones, made a flurry of calls to several people in central Florida a couple weeks ahead of his arrival. Jones and McCormick exchanged a similar barrage of short phone calls during the two days McCormick spent in Orlando, and he made at least one call back to that St. Louis gas station where he worked. 
Jones would later tell police she suspected McCormick went to Florida to pick up marijuana. Jones's explanation went like this. McCormick would accept offers to pick up and deliver packages for money. On several occasions, he brought marijuana into the apartment that he shared with Jones. McCormick told Jones that he was holding the stashes of weed for Baha Hamadala. Hamdala. Um, so here it seems if, if we believe his girlfriend that he is working in an unofficial capacity for that gas station as well. We get a little bit of verification in that, in that we, we hear about these phone records where he certainly did seem to call the gas station back on top of all these numbers that he called in Florida before he went out there. It does seem a little suspicious to me. Seems like he probably was a carrier of, of some kind. But does that necessarily tie to the letters? I don't know. Um, you know, when he's going to Florida to do these pickups, I'm sure that there's logistics information that he needs, like those phone numbers, like some addresses. He's probably have to he probably has to travel around a bit to get all that stuff and then to bring it back. But once he's back, is he then doing some other types of runs for uh, this employer of his at the gas station? Maybe he's doing local drop offs as well. Um, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, it's just another question. What could be in those letters? Could it be something related to drug trade? I think is a, is a strong possibility, but let's continue here. Uh, McCormick never liked to talk about his excursions to Orlando, but he seemed different when he got back that last time, Jones told police. He seemed scared. Around three o'clock in the afternoon of June 22nd, 1999, McCormick walked alone into Barnes Jewish Hospital's emergency room, complaining of chest pains and shortness of breath. Uh, he suffered from asthma and chest pains since childhood. Of course, we know that he has a heart condition he's receiving disability for. This article is also the source where it says that uh, he smoked at least a pack of cigarettes a day since he was about 10 and drank coffee by the gallon. Uh, by his own estimate, he told doctors that he downed more than 20 caffeinated beverages a day. Uh, really don't think that's good for someone with a heart condition. Uh, the doctors ruled out a heart attack, but admitted McCormick for observation and kept him there for two days. He left the hospital on June 24th. Now, if he is a runner of some kind, um, having him disappear for two days, could that have caused a problem for his employer? Possibly. Was there jobs he was supposed to do there? Was he keeping some of the inventory at his home uh, without getting the money back in time? I don't know, but it just seems interesting to me that we have this timeline of these types of events leading up to uh, his death. So two days in the hospital, released on June 24th. McCormick took a bus to his Aunt Gloria's apartment and visited with her for about an hour. In the late afternoon, he left. Uh, he waved off offers to drive him wherever he needed to go. Gloria's last image of Ricky is him walking down the street. Around 5 p.m. the next day, June 25th, McCormick entered the emergency room at Forest Park Hospital. This time, he complained that he was having trouble breathing following an afternoon of mowing grass. Doctors diagnosed his wheezing as another asthma flare-up. He was not admitted, however, and was officially released at 5.50. Gloria says she heard McCormick spent that night in the waiting room before leaving the next morning. Um, now, at least in this case, we get information that the doctors confirmed that he was wheezing and they diagnosed it as an asthma flare up. Um, so two separate medical issues going on. His girlfriend thinks that he was scared after he got back from Florida that last time. Is there another theory about what these hospital visits are about? Um, there is. Basically, his aunt, Gloria, suspects that he was trying to hide out in those hospitals to try to stay protected from whatever he was fearing, whoever was after him or whatever was supposed to happen to him. Uh, I don't, I don't know. I don't know if it really holds up for me, particularly when you have the doctors noting that he was wheezing on his second trip there. Um, but could the stress of, you know, someone threatening him uh, have brought on some of these medical issues as well. I think that's another possibility and certainly something we should consider. Jones told police that she talked with McCormick on the phone at about 11.30 a.m. on June 26th. He told her that he was out of the hospital and was on his way to the Amoco to get a bite to eat. Now, hold on a second. 
if he is afraid particularly of one or both of the brothers and this gas station where a lot of bad stuff seems to buzz around, why is he going to go back there to pick up something to eat? I don't know if that one really makes sense to me, Um, but this article does confirm at least one gas station employee told police that he last saw McCormick there the next day on June 27th. Um, Now, that's a little strange as well because you have his girlfriend saying he's going to be there on the 26th. I mean, he's going to get something to eat. And then you have someone that works there that says, well, no, I saw him there the following day on the 27th. Can we trust the word of the person that works there? Could they potentially be involved in some of this illegal activity as well? Are they trying to cover um, for what happened to him? I think we just have to take that one with a little bit of a question mark. McCormick left the gas station with at most hours left to live. Medical examiners determined he was definitely dead the same day. Now, when you hear that, uh, you know, if the MEs say that he died on the 27th, then not believing the employee really doesn't become as critical of an issue because what the employee is lying to try to knock it by one day. I, I don't I don't know that that would really help um, someone with an alibi or help defend someone. When McCormick's corpse turned up, his girlfriend Jones's thoughts turned to Baha, Bob Hamdala. Jones said she suspected Ricky might have done something wrong in Orlando. Uh, On December 23rd, 1999, St. Charles County Sheriff's Department and the St. Louis Metropolitan Police Department arranged an interagency meeting. Uh, St. Louis police were investigating a man named Gregory, Gregory Lamar Knox, a major drug dealer who operated in and around the housing complex where McCormick had lived as a suspect in several homicides, including at least two murder for hire schemes. A confidential informant told police that Knox was responsible for the murder of a black man who worked at the gas station and whose body was dumped near West Alton. St. Louis police had also linked the Hamdallas with alleged criminal activity and the possible association with Gregory Knox. They began conducting several stakeouts at the Hamdallas gas station and the homes of several of its owners and employees, but unfortunately no arrests ever materialized. Despite ongoing suspicions, detectives could ne- never substantiate claims from informants suggesting a connection between the Hamdallas and Knox or prove that either of them was responsible for McCormick's death. So pretty interesting here that you get a different police agency that gets a tip. A tip seems to match up this story pretty strongly. They go and observe these people and they just can't find the information to pull it together. But I still go back to that initial question. We don't know how this guy died. So think of the lack of physical evidence. They don't know what type of weapon they're looking for. Um, They don't know if he was transported in someone's vehicle. Could they potentially check that vehicle for traces of him being in there? There is just nothing to this story, at least in terms of what's been presented publicly, um, for them to come to a very strong conclusion. And it does seem like getting a tip from a confidential informant is probably the best bet that this case had at being solved. And I think that's why it's come to this point now where the FBI is looking for the public's help. Um, Maybe they're not doing it just to try to get the letters cracked. Maybe that was really a bit of a ploy to raise exposure to this case, to potentially shake out some more tipsters, to have them call in. Uh, I don't know, but I did get a phone number. It is in the description box below. Uh, If you think you have information on this case, please, please call it in. Um, This this is really just a huge mystery. And I think more important than understanding what those letters mean is solving the case. Uh, And I I really believe that the FBI um, is coming from that perspective as well. But I got to tell you, it's really tough when we don't even know how this guy died. And there's something in the back of my head that keeps saying, you know, that natural death explanation, we know this dude had some issues uh, with his health and he didn't have great habits and he was doing some pretty stressful stuff. You know, for all we know, he could have been uh, hitchhiking. He could have been getting a ride with someone and wound up having another 
heart event or wound up having trouble breathing and something happened to him and they just left him out there because they didn't want to be blamed for potentially killing the guy. Um, I really, I don't know, guys. I, I'm, I'm struggling with this one just because of the lack of physical evidence. That always makes it really, really tough. Attempts to contact Baha and Juma Hamdala for this story were unsuccessful. I don't think I'm surprised at that. Uh, Gregory Knox responded to email from prison. At this moment, this is all new information to me, and I have no information that could help your case. Uh, McCormick's family members say they have never heard from police about the Hamdallahs, Knox, or other details of the investigation into Ricky's death. They never heard about the encrypted notes found in his pocket until the local evening news broadcast a report on the codes. Quote, they told us the only thing in his pockets was the emergency room ticket, McCormick's mother, Frankie Sparks, says. Now, 12 years later, they come back with this chicken scratch crap. Uh, contradicting the FBI statements to the media, family members say they never knew of Ricky to write in code. That's another inconsistency that you'll see if you look into this case. I've seen several articles, uh, none that I'm really using for sources here, but I'll have them in the other info section in the description box below. You read through these articles and they talk about, well, Ricky's family says that since he was young, he was always writing in code. It's just something he liked to do his whole life. His family saying they don't know where that came from. They never said that. They, they didn't know him to be writing in code. They did tell investigators he sometimes jotted down nonsense that he called writing, and they seriously question his capacity to craft the notes that were found in his pockets. Once again, leading to that question I was asking earlier, how do we know that he is the one that necessarily wrote those? Uh, also, just for this area, unincorporated St. Charles County has only seen about five unsolved murders since the 1960s. Uh, so despite the fact that um, we have this one that is very troubling, it seems like uh, it's actually a relatively safe area. Uh, moving over to fastcompany.com. The Boston Globe reported that a cryptography expert at MIT didn't hold out much hope for the code to be cracked. The data sample, two notes, was simply too small for statistical models to be of help. Uh, and the guy in the FBI was basically saying he didn't think that that computers were going to really help with this case, that codes like this are made by people, they need to be cracked by people. Um, I've watched a couple of specials on codes being cracked by computers, and uh, I don't think it's impossible. We had the uh, Johnny vlogs we did a couple weeks ago about the letter supposedly uh, left from the nun that was written from the devil, and that was cracked, I believe, by computer, and that was cracked uh, hundreds of years after it was written. I'm hoping that we're not looking at another case that, uh, you know, the, the letter will be cracked hundreds of years later. Uh, heading over to CNN.com. So the head of the unit um, that works with the FBI that's working on this, his name is Dan Olson. Uh, he says, we have patterns. We have very consistent character repeating sequences. There are almost rules to whatever language this is. This is not random. This is not just letters put down. He hopes a member of the public might connect it with a hobby, a game, or a line of work. Uh, the FBI unit often cracks codes in just a couple of hours. It has deciphered secret communications about murder, drug transactions, illegal gambling, and human trafficking. But as of now, 2017, uh, six years after the FBI released this information, it is still not cracked. Uh, I'll tell you guys, I wonder... If when he was uh, acting, if he was acting to, like he needed to stay at the hospital after that last emergency visit, if he was stayed in the waiting room overnight, like his aunt said, I wonder if these were pieces of paper where he was just writing on them um, so that he would hopefully bypass attention that might be directed his way. Maybe he was using it to just make him look like he was waiting for uh, you know, a family member that was in the emergency room or something like that. Um, could these be complete gibberish? I don't know. According to the FBI, and even when I look at it, the way the characters are repeating, it does seem like there's some logic to it. But even for certain sections, it looks like he could have just been repeating the line that's happening above it. Um, 
And if he was truly illiterate, did he analyze real writing to see how letters repeat and then just kind of mimicked that in his own way? I think that's a possible explanation for this. I don't know how strong it is, but outside of that or this being some intensely radical code, um, which how could the other person even reverse this code when it's so hard to crack? I mean, you've literally had thousands of people look into it. They can't crack it. Uh, I don't know. This one's really left me with a bunch of questions, but I think more important than the questions about the letter are the questions about the case. Where's the physical evidence? Where? How do we learn that he is indeed murdered? Um, what killed this guy? How did, how did he die? Uh, without those questions answered, I don't think that I don't think solving this letter, I don't think you're going to decode this letter and it's going to say, hey, I'm the person that killed Ricky. I, I just, I don't see that happening. And what's interesting to me is, at least for the info that I've been able to find on this, the police only looked in one direction of a typical drug deal, assuming that Ricky was a middleman for transporting these drugs. They only looked in the direction of the people that he was directly working for. They didn't look in the other direction of the people that he was buying supply from, like some of these people in Florida. What happened? If he possibly shorted someone money on that side of the equation, they came looking for him. They came to his hometown to find him. Um, would his bosses have protected him in some case like that? Who knows? What if it upset his bosses? What if they learned that he had shorted money from this guy? Could they have coordinated to possibly help him be found by this person so that they could take care of him? There's all kinds of different things that my brain goes to, but from what I've seen, at least what's publicly out there, I haven't seen them really go in that direction. And it's strange because they at least have his phone logs. They know the phone numbers that he called before he took that trip uh, and the phone number. Well, he called them twice, essentially. Um, did they really chase down all those leads of all those separate phone numbers and interview all those individual people? I don't know. If they did, it's it, it hasn't been reported. But um, I also want to let you guys know there is a bunch of great resources for looking into this more. Um, I found this kernelmag.daily.com article, uh, which is pretty well written. Uh, the facts seem a little... Uh, maybe I'd say I mean, I, I'd say it's a little dramatized, but there's a very good piece in here that is a video segment about code cracking. Um, it was actually it was produced by the Riverfront Times as kind of a piece to draw attention to the main piece that we had gone over in this video. Um, but you really need to check this video out. So I'm going to have a link to this in the description box below as well. You've got a Reddit thread down there. Uh, a lot of people discussing the case, a lot of people looking at, I mean, they're literally taking it letter for letter and trying to understand what it means, including the person that thought it might be pharmaceutical information. There is a healthy web sleuths thread, 58 pages long. Uh, I found another one at voat.co that is uh, a conversation about people that are working on cracking this code. Uh, and I've got a handful of other articles I'm going to have in the more info section down below. But this is where I turn it over to you. Please take a look into this case. Take a look at those letters. Do they make sense to you? Um, if they do, perhaps you can send those tips in. Uh, I'll have the FBI's address for the website. They, they don't want to take email or phone calls on those tips. Uh, if you have other information related to what happened to Ricky that you think the police want to hear, I'm going to have their phone number in the description box below as well. And of course, outside of that, let's talk in the comments and share our thoughts and theories about what is going on uh, in this case. Thank you so much for hanging out with me here today. I hope each and every one of you had a nice week, has a wonderful weekend, and I'll see you back here on the Lord Narch channel on Monday. Take care. <laughs>